half in the bag. And we're back. From what? Oh, we've just been watching Snowfalls over and over because it's the only only thing playing on this ancient television set. Every channel is Snowfalls. Oh wait, that's just television static. Oh. Which is what they used for their plug-in snow effect because it was cheaper. <laughs> Someone just filmed their grandpa's TV. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, we're here to today. We're gonna talk about two new-ish movies. New-ish We'll movies. call them new. In the grand scheme of things, they're new. They're more recent than like Lord of the Rings films. And the big movie studio, Universal, figured out that if you shoot a movie cheaper, you make more money. They finally, well, I know they have like a, a connection with Blumhouse. They distribute a lot of Blumhouse movies. And Universal finally figured it out. Hey, maybe there's something to that Blumhouse formula. Let's we, just eliminate the middleman and make our own cheapo movies. We don't have to sit around getting no sleep, sweating in our beds while we worry if Jurassic World <laughs> Fallen Kingdom Part 3 that we spent $697 million <laughs> on is going to eke out a profit. We could make 10 cocaine bears and just see what happens. There you go on this episode of At The Movies. A Knock at the Cabin Fever in the Woods is the newest film from M. Night Shamlam. Something happened in the cabin in the woods that I can't remember because it's been three months since I watched the movie. <laughs> Jay, tell me all about the $20 million low budget M. Night Shamlam film, Knock at the Cabin Fever in the Woods. Yeah, this is the new M. Night formula. Make them, make them cheap. His last few movies, I don't know what the budget for Old was, but it probably wasn't much more than this. Like, oh yeah, Old was the one on the beach. Yeah. I was thinking about the Old People movie. That's that's a very low budget movie. That has right. four characters in it. That's right. That was when people were like, oh, M. Night's just going to make schlock and embrace it instead of being pretentious about it. Yeah. I like this change. <laughs> well, this one, it's not his uh, idea. It was a book. It was based on a book, yeah. and I read a little bit about the book. Because my issues with the movie, I was like, I don't like this, I don't like that. And then all those are things that were changed from the book. Oh, so I found that interesting. I would be curious to find out what. Well, we can talk about it. I like the movie overall, though. Yeah, me too. I, it, I realized M. Night Shyamalan likes, wa uh, likes people watching footage of disasters that are happening somewhere else. Yeah, it's you like can do a whole happening. montage of the yeah, uh, signs when Joaquin Phoenix is watching the TV. Yeah, it's like where... The big thing, the big Roland Emmerich things are happening elsewhere and we're being reported on the news and are kind of disconnected from our characters. That M. Night, even when his movies are weird and kind of bad, they're still sort of clever. And then, so the story is there's a couple and their daughter. A gay couple. A, a gay, two men and a daughter. And they, they go to a cabin in the woods for a vacation. Who does this? Anyways. <laughs> Maybe people started to do it again during the pandemic. Like, I want to get away from my fucking neighbors. They keep coughing on me. Well, I don't know why you would go to just a tiny little house in the woods unless there's some activities to do, like maybe boating or unless you unless you hunt. Maybe if you like to hunt or hike, I guess. But these characters didn't seem like they wanted to do any of that. They just wanted to go in the house. I mean, they, were, they weren't there for very long. I'll give them that. That's true. They got interrupted pretty quickly. Who knows what amazing family activities yeah. they had planned. But that maybe they had showed them with a, with a kayaking boat on their the car, and they, had, they brought their life vests, and the little girl's like, I'm going to go, to, I brought the map of the river, and we're going to go to this and do this. And I have all these activities planned. And but I don't know. I just, I, I don't know. That all could have happened off camera, because the movie just starts, which I liked. Little right. girls yes. playing out in the woods, and Dave Batista just walks up to her, and you're like, what's up with this guy? Something we cut out all fishy. the fat. All the fat is cut out, and we right. just get right into it. Uh, and then uh, we have four random characters from all over the country that all feel compelled by um, 
prophecy or visions to to meet up mm -hmm. and uh and spoiler alert the second they were all there i said oh they're the four horsemen of the apocalypse and i was like oh that's the gimmick <laughs> Got it. No, you're supposed to realize that, that as the, the movie M goes along. That's the M. Night twist at the end, is that they're the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. um, and the premise is, uh, in order to stop the apocalypse, which I always thought the four horsemen were bringing in the apocalypse, but again... Yeah. There's four people and there's apocalypse. It's good enough. Uh, anyways, That's all people remember, I don't right? really care, but they say, uh, <laughs> in order to stop the apocalypse, for some reason, one of you must sacrifice another. Yeah. And it's like Old Testament God stuff where, ah, kill your son to prove you love me. Right. They're, they're the zealots and they're there to, and, and the, the, the whole thing throughout the movies, you're supposed to be questioning, oh, is this real? And that's why it's beneficial that it's a gay couple um, because that would be a pretty fucking scary situation. And you would, of course, assume that these weird religious people maybe have ulterior motives. Yeah. Um, and this is all just a ruse. That seems to be the angle, yes, because like Dave Batista's like, oh, I did not know mm -hmm. that you two were, were man and man. It, to me, that doesn't matter. We're just, you know, and it's like, okay, I believe him, but then there's the whole storyline with uh, the, the more the, rednecky guy. The Harry Potter guy, um, what's his name? He's oh, uh, Rupert Grint. Rupert Grint, Which yes. sounds like a Harry Potter character name. <laughs> yes, it was what? <laughs> Rupert Grint, um, <laughs> the wizard Rupert Grint. He's in that show called... Um, I was going to say, he has an M. Night connection, right? Yes, definitely. He's the in... Dead uh, Baby, the show, whatever the it's dead, called. The uh, Rubber Baby Show. <laughs> it's called um, something with an S. The Servant. It's called Servant. Ah, the yes. Servant or something. It sucks. It started okay, right? Didn't you say it started It, it started okay, but then they just dragged well, it That's out. a thin premise. And that guy, That's like making this movie, Knock at the Cabin, and trying to make a whole season Yes, exactly. Out of it. That's what it is. This is a perfect little self-contained yeah. story. Yeah. It's a, it was a good-looking show. I just stopped watching it after, like, two seasons because I'm like, get to the point. Mm. And Rupert Grint is awful. He's not a good actor. He was fine in this, I think. He was okay in this. But he didn't have a whole lot to do. Yeah. Really? <laughs> so you have the two characters. Um, one of them's more practical. One of them's more kind of leans more towards possibly believing them after seeing evidence. And so they have a little, uh, a little, uh, they start to think, yeah, the movie. Yes, so. Well, that's so, the, the, it's a moral dilemma movie. You have these characters in a situation. Yeah. Do they believe these captors? And then they start to turn on each other. It's all very, like, simple kind of classic stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, and it never gets too ridiculous. No, no. Um, they're showing evidence on the TV of like this big like tsunami wave and all these like natural disasters or prophecies that are coming true, it will lead to the uh, like Armageddon or the end times. And which one of those is something that when I was watching the movie, I was like, this is a little too much when all the planes are crashing. Yeah. If it was like two or three, you could be like, oh, maybe that's a coincidence. Like maybe that's not a prophecy coming true. But it, and that's apparently what it is in the book. It's like three or four planes, and that's it, that crashes. But in the movie, it's like hundreds of planes. Yeah. Well, they, well, they question the legitimacy of the footage, too. It's yeah, they're like, is this pre-recorded? Or, or, or is this, like, computer graphics? Is this faked? Yeah. Like, you know, and so... Things that a logical person would think about because it's an unreal yeah, situation. I, I like the idea of it being... Um, like weird, but like, oh. This like, could be nothing, it could be a coincidence. It could be a so. coincidence, but yeah, hundreds of every plane falls out of the sky at once is like, oh, there's something really weird. That's yeah. a little much, yeah. It does have, like, as it gets towards the end, it starts to feel like there is this real looming threat. Like it really had a, yeah. the sky starts to go gray and the thunder's coming in. It's like, is this just a thunderstorm or is this actually the apocalypse? Yeah. Um, but it's one of those movies that puts you in the situation where you're thinking like, okay, there's only two outcomes here. Either the crazy people are right or they're not. Mm -hmm. And it's tricky to pull off either one of those and have it be satisfying. I don't know. If you want to look at it like from just a thematic perspective, it's like the characters, it's about the two men and their love for each other and the one is willing to sacrifice himself so that the other two, the, the other man and the child can live. And he... he it's like taking a leap of faith, almost. Um, regardless of the outcome, you're doing it to save the person that you love. Yeah. 
Um, and I was it's a self selfless act. A selfless act, yes. Um, and he was the more um, one that was more open to pos the other possibilities. The other guy was more of cynic. I was I, I, when he when the spoiler is uh, when, when the sacrifice occurs and it ends. I was like, oh god, is this going to be a missed ending? Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where he died for nothing. And then it turned out it wasn't. And I was like, okay. It would have undermined the whole movie for me. You would have liked the dark ending because. Not, not just because it's dark, but just it would have been, I think, more memorable. More, more memorable, as opposed, more interesting, yeah. yeah. They but, drive away, they go to a gas station, uh, restaurant or whatever. It depends on how you like your movie to end. A happy ending or a depressing bad ending. Yeah. To me, the ending wasn't as important as the journey to get there. Oh, I'm sure, the I'm, rest of the movie's great. I like a movie like this where it's in the hands of a good director who knows how to, to keep it moving and twists and turns. It's very, like, almost paralleled with Snowfalls. You ironically mentioned Snowfalls. Oh, the yeah, because, it's like the polar opposite. Yes. Pol polar cocaine bear opposite. Yes. Well, Snow Falls, it's like, okay, we're in the house uh, for so long. Eventually, some point, someone's going to go outside, and, and you, 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 have to, you have to keep people engaged. But both in terms of the storytelling and the ratcheting up of the tension and with how you film it. Yes. This whole movie takes place in a cabin. You never get tired of that location. Exactly. Boom. And, uh, and, and you need people to attempt escape. You need... You know, the little girl escapes at one point, and Dave Batista's in the bathroom, and there's, it's just like, it, 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 let's say M. Night is a more skilled director than the guy who made Snowfalls. And that's all I'll say about it. Did he write the screenplay to this? I don't know. Because it did lack, and this is the thing people complain about with his movies, the weird dialogue. You know, hot dogs get a bad rap. They got a cool shape, they got protein. You like hot dogs, right? The unnatural dialogue that I've grown to like. Like, I like a lot of that stuff in old. It's just so weird. I didn't notice any unnatural dialogue. In no, it. there wasn't in this. And that's why I was wondering if he wrote it, because oh. it, it was lacking that. I wanted to um, mention this. Uh, we're done talking about this. That's fine. It's an okay movie. It's a good movie. It's a pretty good movie. Yeah. Uh, uh, watch it for the performances and the ratcheting of tension, not so much for the ending or the overall premise. But I wanted to mention the Oscars real quick. So when you talked about Adapted, mm -hmm. oh. I wanted to like scream because sequels are now considered adapted yeah, screenplays. Yeah, the Knives Out sequel was like based on characters created by Ryan Johnson in the first Knives Out movie. Yeah. I was like, what the fuck? And Top Gun was in that too, which yes. is a sequel. And you know what was not? The Whale. The Whale was a, a, a stage play and it was adapted into a script by the... By the, the guy who wrote the, the play, wrote yeah. the, the playwright who wrote the stage play. Mm -hmm. Granted, he didn't make many changes apparently because it felt like a stage play, but what's with that? <laughs> I don't know. I noticed that, and I the never... rise of Skywalker, based on Star Wars characters, <laughs> created by George Lucas. I like, can't believe Rise of Skywalker wasn't. What are the either. rules for adapted screenplay? I would never noticed that before. Maybe it's happened in the past, and I just missed it. But this was the first time. It was two sequels. Yeah, Knives Out sequel and Top Gun. Traditionally, Maverick. adaptation means adapted from another source. Yeah. So they might have expanded those rules. And another source usually is. Novel or play, mm -hmm. classically speaking, I guess you can. Now you could say like Doctor Strange is adapted from the comic book, yeah. Like, which is which technically would apply, but It'd apply more than just a sequel to a movie. A, a sequel is that was ridiculous. It was weird. I'd never never seen that before. I know. I just wanted to bring that up because I know we're not going to talk about the Oscars, other than I cried when Ki 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 He Kwang. Uh, hugged uh, Harrison Ford. It was very sweet. There's some dumbass on Twitter that was like, oh yeah, he's grateful now. Why didn't Harrison Ford help Ki He Kwan throughout the last couple decades when he was struggling to get roles? It's like, what the fuck is Harrison Ford supposed to do? Help out every actor he's ever worked with in a movie? Do you exist in the real world, idiot? People are so Tw Twitter is the best place to go to see people say the dumbest things possible. It's true. You should have donated all those Star Wars toys to a children's hospital. <laughs>
those dirty, dirty, sticky, old, child saliva covered, dirty Star Wars figures to a child children's hospital. That you owned and had the right to do whatever you wanted with, but yeah, you should have donated. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, good, good for uh, Ki Ki Kwan and for Brandon. Brendan. Brendan Fraser. Yeah. yeah. Is, is I, oh, whale review real quick? Throw in the whale. Oh my God, we're going to do a mini review of the whale, which I did not like at all. Squeeze it in there. I thought it was pretty good. It was very stagey. But it does go along with, we were talking about, what was the movie we were talking about? I think it was on Best of the Worst. Oh, Mega Lightning. We don't talk about too much as blocking and business. Yeah. These are two B words that involve movie making. Blocking is camera angles and locations. Business is, well, she's gonna do this now. It's, it's a way to make like, like, like boring, boring dialogue, dialogue scenes. Or expository dialogue work. This director says girl comes in, kind of half sits on the, the armchair of, of couch, dad sits in the chair, two shots. That's your blocking. Back and forth, back and forth. They right never there. move. And the whale is like polar opposite of that, where oh, it's like oh. everybody has business. I thought you were saying the blocking was like that. No, 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 it's the opposite of that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's an example of, hey, you got the well, whole movie it, in this tiny room, have your characters move around. So what you're saying is Darren Aronofsky is a better director <laughs> The mega lightning person. The mega lightning director. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm that's making. A hot, the, that's the, a hot take, Jay. The bold statement. That's a bold I'm hot gonna take. I'm going to get canceled on Twitter for my controversial statements. That's a bad take. <laughs> I, I, I can see how he got a standing ovation at Con because the end of that movie is like drama <laughs> overload. Over the top Darren Aronofsky bullshit. Yeah. And I. I like the the story with him trying to you know reconcile his life and what its value was and trying to pass on something because he basically wasted his life mm -hmm. as he says himself. Um, but it, I I applaud the the bold bold decision, risky decision to make a movie that takes place Jesus entirely in an apartment. Yeah, there's a, a couple, couple bits of on the front porch. And that's it. Yeah in the front porch with a guy in a fat suit who looks like Fat Bastard. Ooh! I was gonna say, that was my, the That's hurdle like, that I couldn't get over with the movie is I never saw anything but Brendan Fraser in a comedy fat suit. Towards the end, I, it started to fade away from me. It's and a good his performance. performance. His, his performance is very his good. His performance but, won it over to where I was like, oh yeah, I forgot that was Brendan Fraser. Yeah, early on though, when his suit. daughter, who's like a complete shit through the whole movie, which I appreciate, when she's like, come walk over to me. And he's like struggling to get off the, I was like, I can't take this seriously. I just can't do it. Well, there, there were two moments where I laughed <laughs> uh, where I laughed so much I couldn't breathe. <laughs> when I laugh at the elderly, it was that kind of laughter, right? Okay. It was when he got up. This is up. a drama, by the way. This is, okay, yeah, this is a drama. But when he got up and the table crashed. <laughs> and when he starts choking on the meatball sandwich. Yep. And his friend comes over. Who she hasn't got, I think she maybe was nominated for Best Supporting. But she, was. she was the best thing in the movie. She, she was, was so good. Yeah. Yeah, she was, she was the assistant when... in uh, the menu, Ray Fine's assistant lady. Yes. Yeah. I didn't realize that until yeah. after. Uh, yeah, she was good. And, uh, but, okay, so there were two, two moments that made me laugh. <laughs> and it wasn't because I was, I was like, ha ha funny, fat guy falls down. It was the, the, the sound design. <laughs> More specifically, the part when he's choking on the meatball sandwich, because she comes up to him and she's like hitting him on the back mm -hmm. to try to get. I don't. I don't think she had the ability yeah, to um, when someone's that to Heimlich heavy. him, but she was like, yeah, hitting him on the back, and it was like the the like the Lucasfilm like Indiana Jones pun. <laughs> you know what it needed when he fell over and the table collapsed. You need that pottery break. Yeah, yeah. but the table collapse too was a, was like. Like, it was way too much. So when you hit you hit someone on the back, it's more of a dull thud, hollow sound, less than a like a movie punch. It, that's I, this, this is Darren Aronofsky. This is what he does. Well, Everything's got to be big. Yeah, but that would have made it more like. Um, you ever see a scene in a movie? I think I think it's in Glory, um, the Civil War movie. It's yeah. one of my favorite movies, and I think it's when. Um, is it, is it uh, Denzel gets whipped and it's not a Hollywood whip sound? And it's like, oh, I was really expecting a 
like dramatic Hollywood whips on and it's so dull and realistic. And he's just making this, this face of like hatred towards Matthew Broderick and misery, mm -hmm. you know, pain, because he's getting whipped. And it's, it's, it really takes you out of it. And you're like, wow, okay, that's real. That's the sound we needed when he gets hit in the back. Mm. Is and not Hollywood sound. <laughs> because I was meant, you were meant to not laugh. Yeah. And same with the table break too. And so that really, the, oh, those are really my only criticisms other than I think the, the adaptation of, from the play should have used um, more cinematic language in telling the story. Yeah, it's hard to do because the whole, like he can't go out of the apartment, he physically can't. That's why so. you adapt it and you have some other story. Like really it could have used a lot of um, flashback mm. of maybe when Brendan Fraser is, is gaining the weight thing. And like, you can utilize him out of the suit too. Yeah, you, yeah. Can, you, you can have in between periods when he's like making bad decisions and doing stupid things and even, you know, it doesn't have to like alter the storyline too much. Just just um, get us out of the apartment for a little bit. Yeah, I was I was fine with the whole thing being in the apartment. I, it was for me. It was just the uh, the emotional beats. Everything is so heightened, so over the top. The part when he decides to kill himself with food and he's got like the fridge door open and he's like shoving pizza on top of sandwiches or whatever the fuck and he's just like, Arr! it's like I can't take this seriously. Darren Aronofsky, cool your jets. He made one movie that was not over the top. He did The the Wrestler, which is one of my favorite movies. And I would love to see him get back to something that kind of simple and stripped down. And that's what this could have been, but he just can't help himself. And the score is so over the top. Yeah, he likes drama. It's a, it's a shame. I think it's a waste of a very good Brendan Fraser performance. I'm happy for him. Good for him. He went, you know, went through some shit. Yeah. Had some bad experiences in Hollywood and now he's kind of getting his comeback. Good for him. I just wish it was for a better movie. Uh, he's he's very good on Doom Patrol. Oh yeah. Now they could say Academy Award winner Brendan Fraser, but Doom Patrol's done. I think, isn't it? No. Oh, it's coming back. Yeah. I assume that got canceled in the back. great the Great Purge. Uh, no, I, b I believe it's coming back in the fall. Oh. I'm, I'm surprised it is. But okay. I mean, I love it, but I can't imagine it's a ratings behemoth mm. like that Willow show. <laughs> watch the programs on your TV. <laughs> uh, watch, watch programs. Watch the movies that we talked about, I guess, or don't. <laughs> watch the programs. Programs. Content. 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 It's not content. movies anymore. It's content. Watch it's those not, contents. It's not TV shows. It's content. Willow didn't make enough money with its content, so they canceled it. Move on to next content. Mandalorian Season 3 is not doing as well as Mandalorian Season 2. Bring back Grogu. Bring more content. Give me content. More Stormtrooper. More Darth Vader. More Luke Skywalker. <laughs> more things you know. Less Grogu now. More Grogu less. Another Grogu. Baby, baby Yoda. But yeah, they got to bring in a baby or Yoda. Baby, Smaller baby Yoda. Yo, baby Yoda lays an egg and... He's like a nesting doll. Yeah, yeah it's a little baby or Yoda. We'll call Grogu baby. has a smaller Grogu in him. Oh, he's pregnant. <laughs> There's a Grogu goo. It's a baby, baby Yoda. He's got bigger eyes for maximum cuteness. Consume more content. Anyway, thanks for watching Half in the Bag. <laughs> Uh, so we talked about a, a modestly budgeted Universal movie, and now we're going to move on to, go to, the bathroom. to another modestly budgeted Universal movie. It's Cocaine Bear. Where did Mike go? Millions of dollars worth of cocaine fell from the sky this morning in Knoxville, Tennessee. There's more this out there. They dumped it somewhere. The joke's on you, idiots. Cocaine Bear is the greatest scam in all of movie history. A film created with the sole purpose of viral marketing, casting friends in overpaid roles, and making a quick shit movie where all the funny parts are in the trailer. But wait, you say, isn't that every movie? Yes! Now, I didn't watch the trailer for Cocaine Bear. It had jokes in the trailer? Are you kidding?
I, I'm serious. I didn't watch the trailer. Oh, it, yeah. It was and like that's because I was curious about it uh, going into the movie. I didn't watch the trailer because I was like, well, I'm going to see a movie called Cocaine Bear. I want to go into it not knowing what tone they're going for. So I didn't see the trailer. So I'm assuming the trailer plays it as comedic. Well, before I saw the trailer, I heard Cocaine Bear was coming out, and I thought it was a biopic about John Belushi. <laughs> but then I watched the trailer, and I realized that it's a film about Cocaine Bear. Yeah. What is Cocaine Bear? Well, it's, it's based on a true story with 100,000 quotes uh, around yes, it. Yes, I watched the trailer and then I looked up the based on the true story thing and the, the bear just snorted the coke and fucking died immediately. <laughs> No, he just, I think he ate it. Well, sure. And snorted. Right, you know, <laughs> whatever. He, he, he ate the whole it. brick of cocaine and then and just, just died. died. Yeah. The, the, it's true that a plane flew over Tennessee, Georgia, Tennessee, on the, near the border, I guess. I don't know. And then the guy threw all the cocaine out of the plane. I don't know why. And then they were looking around the woods and they found that a bear ate some of the cocaine and died. And then they never found the rest of the cocaine. And that was the end of the story. But I think. It's sort of, it was sort of like a legend, urban legend, sort of local legend thing about the cocaine bear itself. It was like then stuffed mm. and it was like on display somewhere. And then Waylon Jennings owned the cocaine bear. <laughs> oh. Like, stu- you know, it was like, I think a thing like from the South where it's like, it's like an urban legend. That's the cocaine bear. And if you're gonna make a movie about the cocaine bear, you want to tell the the urban legend version of the story as opposed to the real version, because the movie would be five minutes long. Yeah. So. It, and that's fine. I don't care that it's not true to real events. I I, I want to get the government involved in this whole based on a true story thing, <laughs> where we have like you know the MPAA uh, uh, has rating systems. I want based on a true story levels one one through ten. Mm. Where it's like based, this is like a, a, a one with a little one, you know, little, we'll create a logo for it. It'll just <laughs> that be, you put after the statement based on yes, the true story? Yes, it's a, it's a one. One is the lowest, like the most unrealistic? Yes, and 10 would be the most realistic. Okay. So, and you can go by point scales too, like 9.6 or 8.2, if it varying degrees. I think that's, that's probably too much of a scale. That would get very confusing. Okay, we'll just go one through 10. This is a one. Or even a zero. No, a zero would be like Fargo. Because okay. they say at the beginning of Fargo, based on real events, nothing is like, it takes place on planet Earth. That's the only connection oh, to reality. Sure. That's like Th- most... This movie, there was a bear that ate cocaine. This, that would, rating system would put the Conjuring movies out of business. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, is uh, Elizabeth Banks like a Southern gal or something? Is she? What's her connection to this? Well, I'm a Patriots fan from Massachusetts, but my side chick is the Eagles because I went to school in Philly, and my husband is a Philly fan. Oh, okay. yes. I don't know a lot about Elizabeth Banks outside of she's directed a few things. She directed that Charlie's Angels reboot with Kristen Stewart that vanished before it even came out. Like nobody remembers was that. Drew Barrymore. Thing. No, 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 there was one after that with Kristen Stewart. It came out like three years ago. There was? There was. It vanished from existence. Because and she directed... people that remember Charlie's Angels are in their 70s <laughs> now? There's, there's probably nostalgia from young, younger people for those early 2000s ones. Yeah, they think it's a remake of that. I, I, they yeah, don't I even know. know there was a TV show. From the 70s, yeah. But she directed that. She directed at least one of those Pitch Perfect movies. Okay. I know her more as a comedic actress, and that's when this movie started. Because she's in Wet Hot American Summer and the Wet Hot American sure, Summer Netflix yeah. shows. It's just barbecue sauce. Come on, I want to make out. And the, in the first 10 seconds of this movie, they're playing that same Jefferson Starship song that's at the opening of Wet Hot American Summer. So it's like, oh, maybe this is going to be like absurdists. Maybe that's a little wink to Wet Hot American Summer because they're going to go that route. But I can suck my own dick. And I do it a lot. There's only two ways to do this story. You go that route, like really absurdist, just comedy. And the whole cocaine bear thing is just a flimsy excuse to hang abstract jokes on. Or you play it completely seriously. And the joke is that it's a cocaine bear movie, but it's played completely straight. Mm. And then this movie goes the most wishy-washy, sitcom-y tone imaginable. Park rangers are peace officers, which means we can shoot people. You're safe. Bears can't climb trees. Of course they can! Then why are you up here? (laughs) (laughs) Why do 
I skip school with you? You're bossier than the teachers. Mind looking after Rosette? I have to go to Georgia for the Thornton case. And you said you were good at dogs. I said I had a dog. It's like it got a comedy tone with no jokes in it. It's bad. I was shocked at how amateurish it felt for a movie made by a bunch of professionals. It felt like a best of the worst movie where everyone's just walking around the woods. Yeah, that's the thing is uh, we opened this particular episode of Half in the Bag with a, a mention of big studio, low budget. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what this felt like because my, my favorite sequence was the ambulance part. That was the one part that was kind of fun, yeah. Um, and then they're like, uh, they climb the tree, the, the tree climbing, bears can't climb trees, yes they can. And then the, the, him attacking the, the, the people, the, the Nordic couple in the beginning. The, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, all, the, all the, the juicy bits are all in the trailer. And, um, you know, and really it seems like it has such a blunt obviously catchy title, Cocaine Bear. Yeah. And so that's the viral marketing part. I, I saw some people comparing it to Snakes on a Plane. Exactly. I have had it with these monkey fighting snakes on this Monday to Friday plane. Yeah. Where, where it's like, oh, that's what's gonna hook people in. It's, Sharknado. It's a ridiculous premise. Yeah. yeah. The movie Ruby. itself is almost like an afterthought. Yes, exactly. Um, and that's, it's unfortunate, um, but uh, I don't know. It, what? <laughs> I, I, I was like, okay, what? Well, well, yeah, it, it finds that middle middle ground that it shouldn't have found. Yeah. Of, of well, am I laughing? Is this supposed to be funny? And then everything felt like filler. I was thinking of Tremors a lot while watching it, where it's like you have a simple kind of man versus natural monster, small group of characters. But in that movie, like Kevin Bacon, Fred Ward, they're not like deep characters, but they're fun to watch and they have good chemistry together. Mm -hmm. And then he introduced, you know, Michael Gross and his wife and their gun nuts. And yeah. You take... have all your locals that have their like distinct personalities that are fun to watch. And this movie, Margot Martindale is the only one that stands out is like, she looks like she's kind of having fun. But like Carrie Russell, she's mom. Mm -hmm. She's mom. That's her role in the movie. She plays mom. Who are you? I'm a mom. There's like nothing to her. All the, the Ice Cube son and young Han Solo, like, they're just wandering around the woods. Well, young Han Solo. His has, wife died, that's the thing. Yeah, his wife died and his father is Ray Liotta, a drug dealer, and uh, there's some kind of... They, they tried to, at the end, I couldn't believe they tried to have like actual emotion at the end. They tried to have some sort of sappy thing about like parenting. <gasps> Dad, shut up, Eddie. Dad, shut up. Oh. Get away. Yeah. And it's like, what are you doing at Cocaine Bear? Yeah. The tone was just all over the place. Like, you can't have a serious dramatic moment here. It's so thin, that idea that this is about like parenting. Yeah, oh yeah. Like yeah. what? Because the two baby cub bears show up at the end. And this is, yeah, it's, it's stupid. The Tremors is a good model to have made a movie like this in, where you have a small town and you have, you introduce all of your characters mm -hmm. and you like them all. And you introduce the cocaine bear. Mm -hmm. Maybe have the plane fly over in the middle of the movie, right? Uh, and then the cocaine bear runs amok in the town and it's a survival film like Tremors is. Um, but yeah, this is like just everyone's all over the place. There's no real rhyme or reason of where the cocaine bear is or why he does or doesn't attack. Uh, all I know is the cocaine bear itself probably accounted for half the budget. That's yeah, we looked up the budget. Snock at the cabin was 20 million, and this was 35 million? 36, 38, somewhere in there. Like that. Yeah, so it's like, so oh, that extra little bit went to the bear. Yeah, they shot this in Ireland. I don't know what tax kind of break. tax breaks they get tax in Ireland. Break, but. Yeah, yeah, and there's like lots of connections between all the actors, and I, I wrote them down. I don't oh. know if this is important or not. It, it was just like a who's who of who I was knows surprised each other. No one from What Hot American Summer showed up. Yeah. I was waiting for somebody to, Michael Showalter, or someone to make a cameo. Yeah, well, Elizabeth Banks is the director. Uh, oh, Jesse Tyler Ferguson, he's on Modern Family. Oh, yeah. Elizabeth Banks had a reoccurring character on Modern Family. Mm. Uh, Phil, uh, Lord Miller produces. Oh, yeah, they produced this. Yes, which explains Alden Ehrenreich. Yes, young Han Solo. The connection there. Margot Martindale. Uh, is in The Americans, a show also with Carrie Russell, mm. 
and she co-stars with the guy who was in the beginning, Matthew Rice. I don't know. Clearly, like casting people you know in this movie. That's why I thought it was. Hey, let's a just make a cheap, shitty movie with my friends for fun. We won't take it seriously. Yeah. We get a trip to Ireland. Uh. I mean, there. This and an interesting part too is I looked at who the screenwriter is, and it's some guy <laughs> okay. who wrote like three other low-budget movies. Mm. One screenwriter. It's rare these days. So it's like, here's a script. You, Elizabeth Banks, you want to make Cocaine Bear? Sure. I'm she from should Tennessee. have said, let, let me hand it off to David Wade and Michael Showalter and they can do a pass on it. Sure. <laughs> yes, exactly. Full-blown comedy. I'm late. The other route, and again, comparing this to Snake, did you ever see Snakes on a Plane? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it since the theater, but I remember being surprised that I actually kind of liked it. Yeah, it was okay. Because it was there was all the lead up to it. Ah, it's an internet joke. And so the studio shot new things to put into the movie to make it more schlocky. And that stuff stands out. But then the rest of the movie, I was like, oh, they're playing it mostly straight. Like, it's a ridiculous premise, but they're just trying to make a serious movie out of it. And it's like, they're relying on you to get the joke, which is that the movie itself is the joke. Yeah. And that's what you need to do, I think, to, to make it work. But it's like, this movie doesn't trust the audience enough to, no. to, to make that creative leap. It delivered to that vast middle section. I, I talk about the, the, the intelligence curve. It's a perfect bell curve mm. of IQs, right? <laughs> from low IQ to high IQ, and the middle is a giant bell curve, right? Sure. Where the, and so it's like what people go to watch Cocaine Bear, it's not gonna get super serious, and it's not gonna get super goofy, it's gonna be just funny enough, and show the bear just enough. That's why I felt so meddling and, and dull to me. Like I really, I think I would have been better with if Cocaine Bear went to a more serious route. Sure. And, and also I, I feel like like cheated a little because we didn't get that ending where the the, the there, there was no plot where where it was like Everyone wandered around in the woods. They had to get the drugs back. Yeah, but there was that plot line and then the plot line with the mom and then they converge at the very end. I'm a mom. And it's about family. They, it, Margo, For some reason, Margot Martindale as as the you have her has be the the wayward uh, like like park ranger. First of all, you don't cast Margot Martindale. <laughs> I, I I love her. She's in millions of things. She's great as sure. Margot Martindale in a movie. But you you cast some schmuck who is the park ranger who wants. Do you remember she make, made a comment like, uh, I I really want to work my way up to. Yellowstone, and mm. I'm stuck at this shitty park. Yeah, you have some like overzealous park ranger who wants to move up in the world of park rangering, and this is his big chance. Sure. And um, he's got a, a, a tourist car has broken down. He's got spring breakers over here, and 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 the power lines fall down. The phone lines fall down. I something the, the, cuts the town off, and you, the cocaine bears run amok. But just over the, the valley is the town. Mm -hmm. And Cocaine Bear in the middle, at the, the, the height of the second act, Cocaine Bear has dragged the, the duffel bag of cocaine to his bear den where there are nine other grizzly bears. Oh my God. And you up the stakes halfway through and all these cocaine bears are gonna go into the town. <laughs> and and uh, you don't wanna get as cliched as it's the big 4th of July parade, wow. but that's the scene I wanted at the end, where Cocaine Bear smashes through walls <laughs> in this little main street and goes through a coffee shop, through a dentist's office, through a flower shop, and is just going you don't, you don't want your boring characters sitting on a dimly lit edge of a cliff arguing about what it means to be a parental figure? I want to see the marching band going down Main Street and then all the <laughs> instruments flying and the marching band members fly up in the air. Mm -hmm. What's that? What's causing that? It's a cocaine bear! <laughs> 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 
Did you ever see the Piranha re remake, the 3D, Piranha 3D? But this was like 10, 12 years ago. Oh, yeah, I heard about it. I did watch that, it. That's a movie that gives you your money's worth. Okay. That's a whole beach of spring breakers just getting chewed in half and uh, uh, climbing over each other to get out of the water. One character's hair, she has her hair in a ponytail and it gets caught in the, the back propeller blades of a boat and rips her face off. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's endless it's endless gore and again that's played it's it's sort of silly but it doesn't have cheap sitcom jokes like this movie does. Yeah. Yeah, this movie doesn't have and then that ending. I want to talk about this. This is a little bit of a side tangent. The ending of this movie takes place on a cliff and it's all dimly lit gray and blue. Yes. And I've noticed this trend in like modern cinematography and I don't know if this is related to shooting digital now where like you don't have to use as intense of lights as bright of lights everything's trying to look so natural now that it doesn't look cinematic and it just looks blah and gray there's no definition there's no key lights no highlights i've noticed a lot more a lot of tv shows like i know the last season of game of thrones people were complaining about that it's like they're trying to go for natural lighting. They don't want things to look like sourcey or something, but it's like, you can do that because it's a movie and people understand the language of cinema. Especially if it's cocaine bear. And if it's cocaine bear, sure. It can look Pop like a key a light on your actors. Yeah. You compare that to, I was thinking of like, like the scenes on like the side of a cliff in Lord of the Rings movies. Like, sure, in real life it would be pitch dark, but we need to see what our characters are doing. Imagine if they shot the ending of Titanic now. Yeah, yeah, everything would just be gray. There would be fucking pitch black. <laughs> that you won't give up. No matter what happens. It's okay to have uh, uh, natural sources for your lights because it's a movie and people want to see what's happening. As long as it doesn't look like just a light blaring on the actor where it's like, oh, they just have a light right yeah. out of frame. It shouldn't look like a Don Dohler film. Yes. But it should... Uh, <laughs> Give it some dimension. Give dimension. some shape to the shadows. Yeah, I noticed that ugly blueness. I hate that, and I've noticed it more and more lately. Because you're a piece of crap person and a bad dad! It gives you just enough to leave you satisfied with the concept, but it didn't take its time and take itself seriously enough to make like a fun movie it was it, it feels like a con yeah um and and it I was, feels kind of asylum like it feels asylum like yeah that's a good that's a good way to describe it is that it didn't feel like a big universal pictures movie you want to have fun with that concept that, well, that's why the ambulance scene was the funnest part because yeah. it was like a like a a sequence i know why we just leave him the ambulance paramedics show up and they discover the scene. The guy goes in the, the broom closet and sees the cocaine bear. Boom, boom, boom. They have to get Margot Martindale on the thing. And her, the It was sort of weird. There was a moment, the one paramedic has the stethoscope to Margot Martindale, yeah. and she's trying to whisper, bear. <laughs> and then she finally whispers, bear. bear. But we already know there's a bear. If that was like our first time seeing cocaine bear, that would have been so much more exciting. But we've already seen the bear. Who do you think you are, Alfred Hitchcock? I, you know, something. But yeah, they. So then they try and escape. The back doors of the ambulance are open. The one paramedic has to jump in while it's moving. It's, it's got fun. some momentum to the momentum, it. Momentum. Uh, Marco Martindale flips yeah, out the back. That, that was fun. <laughs> um, more stuff like that. The the one big laugh I got out of the movie was at the end. We have uh, Ray Liotta. He gets his guts eaten out by the by the tiny bears by the bear cubs. And then it ends with in loving memory. <laughs> As his corpse gets knocked he off. He gets the... pushed off a cliff. Yep. In loving memory of Ray Liotta. That was the best laugh in the movie, and I don't think it was intentional. We'll never come down. <laughs> kind of crazy to think that studios are becoming like the asylum. <laughs> Universal Pictures. Universal Pictures is the new asylum. This asylum, they're doing something right. <laughs> They keep making pictures. <laughs> They've been in business for 30 years. Yeah, I hope they've not gone out of business yet. Because they have a, a funny title. <laughs> a catchy idea. And then the movie doesn't matter. And then the movie doesn't matter. And they make it for super cheap. Oh, why haven't we been doing this? Peter Jackson, you're fired! <laughs> but then you have an avatar. 
Oh yeah, that's the polar opposite. And a uh, hundred and and seventy five million ghosts went and saw Avatar. I have not heard a single person talk about Avatar two, but it's the biggest movie ever. I don't know how this works. Ghosts saw it. Ghosts saw it. Can ghosts buy movie tickets? <laughs> Is this something Zach Bagans needs to investigate? <laughs> 500 billion people went to see Avatar 2, but we couldn't find a single person that actually saw it. Is this the world's biggest paranormal phenomenon? 175 million ghosts bought tickets to Avatar. This usher said he walked into a sold out show and didn't see a single person. Check out his. But he felt a cold wind <laughs> pass over him. Took out his PKE meter. <laughs> And it went off the charts. Every theater for Avatar 2 has been completely empty. And all the tickets. James Cameron buy all the tickets himself. Are there any, like, uh, not night vision cameras, but like a camera that can pick up ghostly apparitions yeah, on them? Yeah, absolutely. We need yeah. to have those installed into all of our, our movie theaters across the nation to, to capture these Avatar 2 moviegoers, because I want to know where they're at. A full spectrum camera that shoots, uh, that, that, that records not just in the visual spectrum, but, right. uh, and, uh, or a heat, uh, heat, heat camera that can um, detect like blobs of cold mass. That's really used in ghost hunting too. All right, we need to get Zach Baggins on the phone. We need to start this investigation and figure out who's seen Avatar 2. You're right, just film the theater, just and there's still all these like blobs of cold mass. This is completely full. Shut up. <laughs> just shut up. 